For those that don't know me, as Neil mentioned, my name is Jennifer Sabrin, and along with my husband, Brunel, we own and operate Antero Agronomy. We are based in St. Jean, and we're completely independent, and uh, we have a, a variety of different uh, you know, areas that we work in. We uh, offer agronomy research. We have uh, a pretty extensive research group. We do industry research as well, and then some benchmarking. So today what I wanna do is I may ruffle a few feathers, but I want you guys to think about, well, we're gonna take a little stroll in the past, okay? We're gonna go oh, take a walk down memory lane. We're gonna think about how farming used to be, how farming is today, what we've learned and how we can start to integrate some of what we're learning through science and what we've learned from the past into how we can move into the future. Okay, so how did we start farming? Does this look familiar to anyone? Maybe a generation or two back, right? Immigrants, they came over, promise of new land, bright future, but what did they encounter, right? They encountered land that was covered by multiple species, lots of trees. They had to break the land. They're using plows, right? This is before any, any of the industrial revolution here. We can see right here in these black and white photos that those, that soil is getting turned over completely, right? We're not leaving any residue on the soil at this point. We're not protecting that soil from any wind or water erosion. And weeds were definitely problematic. What's going on in this picture? He said summer follow, exactly. I'm like, you had it right. But yeah, summer follow. So now why are we summer following? Okay, weed control, sure, conserving moisture. And what often happened when we let the soil rest for a season? We didn't have synthetic fertilizers yet. So if you let it rest, the idea was that you let the microbes work. They would then break down. They'd have time to break down that organic matter. And then they would release nutrients so that when then you came in and planted again, you would have all, this, all these nutrients. What do we think about that today? Why don't we summer follow today? Can't afford it, why? Okay, can't, can't take a year off. So there's the financial side of things. Okay, what else? Oh, okay. That's a great one. We got chemicals to control weeds now for the time being. I will say it that, for the time being, yes. What about wind erosion, water erosion? What is stopping this from blowing away? Let me see by the show of your hand, how many people have seen snurt? Do we know what snurt is, right? What is it? Snow and dirt, right? We've all seen it. I saw so much of it on the way here today. And how does that happen? Well, there's nothing left on the soil to cover, to prevent that topsoil from blowing, it ends up in the ditches, right? Is that gonna benefit you in any way? No, not typically. The reason that these guys, when they first were breaking the soil, they were getting good, um, they were getting very good yields because the organic matter was very high. Okay, when they first broke it, they thought that there was roughly about 10 to 15% organic matter. Does anybody hear soil sample? I know some of you do because we do it for you. So has anyone ever looked at your percent organic matter? Are you at 10, 15%? Some feels impressive because I would bet most of my, well not, I bet money that not very many have double digit organic matter, okay? So why is organic matter so valuable to us? Why do we care? What is this soil organic matter, right? We hear, or even if you're just hearing it called organic matter, but we're just referring to soil organic matter. What, what's the reason? So this is, this is a photo that we actually took. Can you farm that ditch? That ditch was full. There's probably like 18 inches, if not more, of topsoil sitting in that ditch. We care as agronomists and you guys should care as farmers because your soil organic matter is what drives 90% of the function of plant growth. When we see wind and just the topsoil taking off, whether it's up into the atmosphere and gone or whether it blows into your ditch, it's still not land that you guys can farm. But this is what controls 90% of the yield you guys get on your fields. 
So should we not care about this? And keeping it on the area of land that you guys are actually farming? What do you, okay, I don't think many of us remember the 30s, but I've read about it. What did they often refer to the 30s as? Dirty 30s or like the Dust Bowl, right? So again, this is how they were farming. There was no covers. There was no residue left. They were turning everything right over and they still had wind. There was still water erosion. So we lost, like, or they're estimating that, they, that we've lost about half the organic, of the soil organic matter. That's why I asked who has fields that are like over 10%, because if we had 10 to 15 back in the 30s and we've lost half, I haven't seen too many that were, that carried like uh, five or six percent is pretty, on the average of what we see on the upper end, sorry. The other reason we really need to care about this, care about it, is because it can take over a century to build one percent of true organic matter. Do you guys know what I mean by when I say true organic matter? Has anyone gone no-till or min-till? Okay, and have you taken a look at your soil test from one year where you did conventional to the next? And then did you celebrate and say, look at me, I have 2% more organic matter already. That was the best decision ever. Does anyone know why you've likely had a jump like that in one year? Not 100 or 200, but in one year? Do you guys know what's likely happening? It's the way that we, these tests are done. We take cores, we try our very best to clean off the surface, right? But we can still get some, some straw in there. Then when we send that off to the lab, they mix it up or they dry it down, mix it up, so it gets burnt off. So because there's a difference in the weight of that sample, it says, oh, organic matter's gone. So that's why you get your percent. But it's not true organic matter, which is gonna make a difference here. Okay, so soil organic matter, very important. It drives 90% of what happens on your field. But how do we get organic matter? Okay, like what, what is it? We said previously it's the decaying, it's, from, it's made from like the decay of anything, anything living. So it could be plant, it could be animal, uh, insects, anything that's decaying, then those nutrients are being returned to the soil. That is what then helps to build your Soil organic matter. Soil composition, okay? So I know I want to build or I want to maintain my organic matter because that's what's driving my yield. How do I, if I don't have six, seven, eight percent organic matter, how do I get there, right? That should be something that you guys all want to do, right? So how do we get there? Well, first thing we need to look at is our soil composition. There's some people here that are going to be from farther out east, which are closer to the river that have a higher clay composition. Others that are maybe a little bit farther here to the east or to the west, sorry, that are, have a higher sand fraction. But the ideal composition of soil is roughly this breakdown, where we want to have about 45% of the mineral fraction, so whether it be sand, silt, or clay, 5% organic matter, so that's like the food that's feeding our microbes. We want to have 20 to 30% water, 20 to 30% air. What is air matter in the soil? There's lots of air above. Why do we care? Microbes need oxygen. Absolutely, we need oxygen for that decomposition for their bodily functions. So if we don't have air in the soil, are we gonna have the populations of microbes that we want? No, because we're gonna then have the anaerobic populations taking over. Has anybody ever smelled like sort of sour soil? Especially after like it's been waterlogged and then it slowly starts to drain out and you just get that nasty smell? It's because it's the anaerobic microbes that have been leading the way during a the uh, like the wet part of uh, like whether it be a flood or whatever. We have to be very specific now, or we have to get a little bit refined. We want our pore spaces to be no smaller than 0.5 of a micron, but no bigger than 10 microns. Well, I, I, I can't quantify a micron because like that's just way too small. These microbes need to be able to move 
through the pore spaces in liquid. So that's where we need water. Obviously, we also need it for the, the plants to absorb nutrients. But uh, we also need it to be bigger than 0.5 so that the micro microbes can actually get in between all the different particles, the soil particles. But then we don't want it to be too big because if the pore spaces are too big, then the microbe is gonna, it's gonna dry out and then they can't move. Microbes are the most active between 50 and 75% field capacity. Have we had anything close to field capacity over the last few years at times and depending on where you farm, right? Last year along the border, caught lots of rain. Up by Brunkild, SOL. And a little cloud here and there at the right time, you know, makes everybody look like an amazing farmer. So we have to think about this too. We need to have like 50 to 75% field capacity. That's how, that's what, the, that's what the microbes like. That's their ideal environment. We have to have the pore spaces that are just the right size. Am I starting to sound like Goldilocks and like <laughs> the three bears here? Just right. And then they also like it to be between a certain temperature. So when our soil is cooled off, like it is right now, they're dormant. They're not dead, they're dormant. But as soon as we hit about four and a half degrees, they're gonna start to become active. They're active in the spring because we often have that, that runoff, or sorry, the, the spring melt. We don't want it to be running off. And then they're active at about 26. Last year, the last week of May, in 2023, we were already above 26 degrees. There was three weeks, the last week of May, the first two weeks of June, we hit records where we were above, we had the most days above 30 on record. What's happening to your microbes? Are they active? What do microbes do? They go dormant, but having nutrients being released if our microbes aren't active. Here's the interesting part. Their activity doubles every five degrees if the moisture is there. So they can be very, very active in the spring and then they can start to, you know, peter out a little bit as the, the temperature rises, but also as the soil, soil moisture drops. When we hear about mineralization, that then slows down. But if we can maintain the moisture, I'm not sure if people here have irrigated land or not. You can maintain a particular amount of moisture, but it's pretty tough to control the, the temperature. We don't want to have too much water, no, not enough air, or vice versa. So that means I'm looking for a specific structure. Okay. So on the left here, you'll see that we have nice pore spaces where we can have water in there. We can have room for air. And you can just imagine like the, the microbes that can move in and about the, um, the soil particles. On the left, it's a lot more compact. It's not very, like you're not gonna see water move through this profile very easily and nor will your microbes. So we don't wanna have sand silt or uh, a clay in a layer and then like have a water layer and you know, it has to be mixed together. Again, like I said, sounding a little bit like Goldilocks, you know, needing things to be very, very specific. The reason being that we have to have all of these things put together, we want to have aggregate stability. So as the microbes consume, they're excreting uh, polysaccharides and glycoproteins, and that is what acts as cement, binds these little soil fragments together and it makes a bit of a clot. Has anyone, actually I, I, I'm sure all of you have, gotten out of the tractor, you're seeding, you're digging to make sure that you're putting your seed into moisture. So you're looking and you've grabbed a handful of soil and you've moved it around in your hand and have you ever said, oh man, it's going through my fingers, it's too dry, or oh man, this is muddy, it's, it's I'm maybe seeding a little too deep. Or if you can keep and form a ball of dirt, then you're like, ah, it's just right. You've got a fungal hyphae, the actinomycin filament, roots, all of these in the soil, they bind everything together like rebar or rope, right? Would anybody here pour cement without putting some rebar down? Okay, so we shouldn't have soil that doesn't have these particular 
elements binding our soil together. Here's something, this is not research that we did. It is research that the you know, uh, Matuba Ag, uh, Mitchell Timmerman. What they wanted to show here is the importance of aggregate stability in water, why it's important to have some living roots or have some cover on, on your soil. So sometimes starting on the right, going to the left, sometimes, and I saw this driving here today. There's fields that are bare, bare, bare. Then, okay, there are some that have a little bit of residue. Okay, I didn't see anything green like that because clearly it's not the right time. I did see some like the far left picture, but it wasn't farmland. It was just uh, more of a park area. Anyway, so what they did in this demonstration is they took soil from different fields that had, you know, living roots that had just uh, a residual, like so straw cover. And then that had been cultivated and there was very little residual left. They poured equal amounts of water over top to see what is going to happen. Who can predict? Well, you can kind of sort of see already what happened as the water went through. Do we think that we've got more infiltration on the left or on the right? Yes, to the left. This is the soil. You can see some of the green uh, leaf material. So that was from the third picture from the right. Now, can you see how there's, I, I'm not sure if it's going to show up very well, but can you see like how like there's little like chunks and like the, like the soil hasn't like fallen apart. And then here, like it just looks, well, it looks washed out, right? Soil structure, they had good aggregates, they had roots. And they also had soil armor, so they had residual on, or like residue, sorry, on the surface. That water was able to find its way down and into the soil, and it came through pretty darn clear, right? You can see that picture in the back. Now, the container from, this is the soil from the absolute right of that other picture, the previous picture. Very little soil made its way through, it ran off. And look at the color of that water after it ran across the surface. Does that make you happy seeing that? That a whole bunch of your topsoil and that's soil organic matter that's just being eroded away. What does soil organic matter control? Everything, like 90% of soil function or plant growth is controlled through your organic matter. If we don't have proper internal structure, we're not able to capture that rain. I'm gonna put it right out there that you guys are all great farmers on your own farm. You guys know that soil inside and out. You guys run your equipment fantastic. I am not gonna say anything about that, but I can guarantee that nobody to this point or very few are actually able to control the number one limiting factor to your yield. And that's water, unless you irrigate, but that is water. To start to think back, how can we increase the internal structure of our soils, build these aggregates, which we know it's the microbes that do that work, to then give us a really good layer of, or like percent of soil organic matter so that we can control 90% of what happens on our field. Would you guys like, not like to have control of 90% of what happens on your, in your field? I sure would. So now here where it's gonna, you know, some people are gonna maybe get mad at me here. So. But farming doesn't look like that, does it? Farming today is a whole lot different. We don't use horses. We don't have one or two row plows. I'm not saying that these pieces of equipment are terrible, because they're not. They are beneficial in certain situations. But what we do know, and I'm not picking on anyone, and I am not saying that tillage is bad. What I am saying, though, is it will destroy your soil aggregates. We just talked about having those soil aggregates, having that soil structure so that water can infiltrate. That is your number one limiting factor to your yield. We are not controlling it. So if we run our equipment across our field, we're destroying these aggregates. Fewer aggregates means less pore space. If we have less pore space, we have less space, or we have reduced microbial activity, we have less water in our soil. And if we have reduced microbial activity, you have less productive soil. Does anyone agree with me on that? Is anyone ready to throw their tiller away? No, good, don't, because tillage is not the devil, okay? I do not want anyone living here today saying, oh my God, Jen was talking about like throwing the tiller 
into the back 40. I'm not. What I am saying, though, is that we're really good at growing residue in the Red River Valley. We produce a whole lot of residue, especially after all of our cereals, corn, sunflowers. If we do not incorporate after, like in the fall, we're likely not getting on in spring. If we try to work our soil, and I say we, sorry, farmers close to the Red River where we have a higher percent of clay. It's different for those that are a sandier soil type. But if we try to work the soil in the spring, we're going to create cement. Because what we're doing is we're breaking those aggregates and then everything, it looks really nice until the next rain. Then that next rain, all of those aggregates that were broken apart, they then start to fill up the space, like the pore space that were there, and then it seals off the surface. And how many people here have had canola that can't get up and through that crust because it's not strong enough, but yet we thought we did everything right. And it's just like, oh, that darn rain at the wrong time. Maybe we have to start to look back and tweak a few things. So incorporating this, residu or this residue is important. We need as much of the, the surface uh, available to the microbes to start to uh, decompose it. If we don't cultivate, we will have cooler temperatures in the spring. Dark soils absorb heat. It, we can get in there a little bit earlier. And it also helps with some moisture management. Fall of 2019, we had three inches of rain the end of September. Then what happened that October, that Thanksgiving weekend? No storm, right? Shut everything down for like two to three days. But then what happened? It also shut down harvest, right? Because could we then get back? So September, we're waiting for things to dry up. Oh, great. Thanksgiving, we have a snowstorm. Okay, now, now we have to wait for it to freeze up completely to get machines into the field to then be able to get soybeans and corn and sunflowers off. Those fields did not get a single implement run through them, whether it be vertical tail, whether it be, you know, cultivator. Nothing went through. And then what do you think happened in the spring? What happened in the spring of 2020? Not COVID lockdowns, which happened, but not that. Talking here. What happened in the spring of 2020? It didn't match, right? Uh, people were trying to harrow, trying to open it up, trying to get that moisture up because the soil was waterlogged from those 13 inches in September and then it froze over. So you had just a swamp underneath frozen soil. So in the spring, I've never felt this before and I'll remember it till, it was like I was walking on a waterbed or like if I had ever walked on Jello, that's I think what it would be like. Like the soil, like, you know, you weren't, losing a boot because we do in the red river gumbo you literally you could walk across it but it was moving underneath you because there was so much moisture those are some of the things that we have to remember so when i when i do talk about tillage and what it the harms it does we definitely have a need for it because of the soil composition thank gosh we have brilliant people in this world that have come up with all sorts of ways that we can work soil that we aren't deep ripping all the time. So your chisel plow, you know, it's going to do probably like the most damage. Then you've got your strip till, vertical till. These are all very important in and of themselves for different reasons. So it, like, I'm not, I'm not here recommending you get one or the other, not, not even maybe. What I am saying is that we need to use it wisely. We have to know why, not just because I want a, a field that looks black, you know, because I remember my grandpa, he used to be so proud after he would finish cultivating the fields. He's like, oh, look, it's beautiful. It's just black and it's great finish. It's nice and smooth, perfect. But then what happened? Well, it blew and then, you know, weeds came and, and all the rest, right? So, and we also know that the microbes didn't have living roots to, to be fed with. So, there's those other issues as well. What I want to say here is that we've made great strides with equipment. Guys will say, I want to put down all my fertilizer. I just want to make one pass. Okay, so planting, we can't do that unless you've got a liquid kit and then you're stopping more often. So then your efficiency is down. So there's always a give and go. Strip till, we can, you know, make a, a berm about 10 inches, leave about, you know, 20 inches or so, uh, depending on the spacing. Uh, if that was 30 uh, of residue, nothing nothing touched so that we have like soil armor. We've got reduction of wind and water erosion and we're actually being able to place fertilizer. Vertical till, 
that doesn't disturb too, too much uh, of your soil, but yet it will, you know, it helps to break up that residue. So we can get it into smaller pieces, more surface area for the microbes, and hopefully we can get it incorporated just a little bit so that we, we don't have too, too much left over. But we need to remember, it's like stoking a fire. As we pull any kind of tillage equipment through any kind of a piece of equipment through the soil and we're mixing it up a bit, it is like we are, we're, we're stoking the fire because we're introducing bacteria into a soil where they normally wouldn't be and we're adding oxygen. So now we have bacteria who could then eat those glycoproteins so like the glue that holds aggregates together that are formed by microbes, those bacteria will come in and eat that. So what happens if that glue or we pull the rebar out or we take away all of the support system? What happens? Your soil is going to collapse. So even though for a brief time, you can pull that chisel plow through and be like, ha, look, I've got lots of water that'll infiltrate in. Not for long. That soil will collapse and your structure will need to rebuild itself. So think of a factory that builds track. You can have parts that have, uh, that are working on the body, the frame, you got others that are working. Okay, I'm not a mechanic, so please don't laugh too hard. You know, others that are working on like the axles and all that other part. And then there's some people that are working on the interior. If we wreck a factory, like we are wrecking the homes of, or like these microbial colonies, if you want to think of them as factories, if we're wrecking that factory, do you think you're going to have the tractor output that you had prior to cultivating? No, because now you have to go and fix and rebuild your factory. And even if the factory doesn't get you know, destroyed, you may have an area where you have workers in that factory that aren't showing up. Maybe, you know, I don't know, they, they got destroyed. So you might have your workers that show up to put the, the body together and you've got the other that are ready for the axles and everything else. But maybe the people that are like the workers that put the interior together got destroyed. Can you successfully produce or ship tractors without an, a complete interior? No, no one's gonna want that. Just like here, as we pull these uh, pieces of equipment through the soil, we are wrecking these factories and so the microbes need to rebuild themselves. And that's what is great about some of these that we don't have as much damage as we would have seen prior. You've heard me talk about keeping the soil covered. We may not see uh, residue this thick, but what residue does is it will absorb the impact from raindrops. Raindrops can damage the, the, uh, the soil structure. Therefore, your soil can then, or those, if those aggregates start to break down, your soil will fall apart. So we want to protect that soil. You guys know it as well as I do, that soil underneath the residue will not warm up as fast. And that's what you guys always say, well, I don't want residue on the soil, on the surface, because I want my soil to warm up in spring and I want to see and I want that, those plants just to pop right out and away we go. 100%, I agree with you. But on the flip side, until that canopy closes, what is cooking between the rows? Your soil. If there's nothing covering that soil, the sunlight is hitting it and it is cooking it. And what happens when we have an increase in the temperature of soil? If we think back to microbes and their ideal activity, like the temperature, they're active between four and a half and 26, right? We've measured soil that is like well, like 90 degrees and up between the rows and it was between soybeans because the canopy hadn't closed yet. Right by the, by the plant in the shade, oh, it was about you know, 55, 60 degrees but in the middle, like 90 degrees. So now your, your microbes are, are working less, they're less active, so they're not mineralizing. If we can keep it, the, the, the surface covered, we can reduce evaporation. We know as we evaporate water from soil, we have salt that gets left behind. I see the excess salt in some fields. And what's growing in those areas? Kosha, there it is, that's right. Not the crop you want, but kosha, good old kosha. If weeds do not have direct sunlight, they, their emergence will be drastically reduced. I won't say they won't emerge, but it'll take them a whole lot longer, which then gives your crop a fighting chance to outgrow them, cover the canopy, choke them out, we're done. Someone said earlier that, uh, you know, we control like weeds right now by brain for a while. There are some nasty resistant weeds that have arrived. We deal with water hemp. We see 
three-way resistant kosha, we know there's populations that are seven-way resistant just on the other side of that border. Which way do geese and uh, the river flow? They come north, right? It's a matter of time. We're dealing with it over there. It's a matter of time. So we cannot count or bank on spraying our way out of this. We need to think of other ways. And I'm not saying that we have to go this, like to, to leaving a residue like this, but we have to start thinking outside of the box because chemistries are not advancing as quickly as these resistant weeds are. Residue also provides a source of food for the microbes. And then if it is slightly cooler, right, as I mentioned, not 90 degrees Fahrenheit, then they're, they're a little bit more active. This is from NDSU. Some research was done just obviously on the other side of the border. The residue incorporation, like so tillage systems, no-till, vertical till, chisel plow, and then strip till. Three different locations, and the temperatures were taken from two inches deep. Where you had no-till in that area, and this is from the state, so Fahrenheit, 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Vertical till, 47. Where we had the chisel plow, 50. On either side of your strip till, 45. Middle, 51. So the strip till, chisel plow, very similar, but yet we had cooler areas on either side of that strip. Whereas when we use a chisel plow, we're trying to make that whole field black. This is what evaporation looks like from those same areas, those same uh, tillage tools. This is what it looks like. No till, we had 30% moisture left. Uh, vertical till, we had 25. Chisel plow, 19. Strip till, 18. And then we had 29% on either side of the strip till. I love the idea of strip till. I don't think it's very practical, but I love it. And I would love to find a way to make it work here. How we can keep the number one limiting factor on your farm, how do we keep it in the soil where it needs to be? Because this is what your plants need to access. They need that water. We also have improved seeding equipment. So I don't want to just like, you know, rain on the, the tillage implement, you know, parade. But we have single disc, we got double disc, we got planter. These pieces of equipment can place that seed so precisely and disturb very little soil that, you know, we should be able to get the seed exactly where we need it to be and not destroy those factories, those microbial colonies that are gonna be making that organic matter that drive 90% of the yield on your fields. Narrow rows. You're gonna hear a lot of people starting to go back to narrow rows because we have resistant weeds. We need to be able to close this, the canopies and not just resistant weeds, but we have seen through research that when we have narrow rows, we have better yield. And with that, be, or I, I say that I'm through canola, cereals, uh, would love to do it on corn. Anyone? Anyone looking for people? Would love to see 15, 15 inch corn. Love it. If you're interested, contact. You have fewer seeds in a row. You have less competition amongst plants. And you, you have, there's more access to the microbes when you have more rows. Same seed, uh, seeding rate, more rows uh, per, um, per acre, right? So that's another thing that has, that we're gonna see. We're gonna move back to that. Those are all things that I want to mention on disturbing soil. So we know that if we disturb soil, we break down aggregates, we don't have the microbes and have to rebuild those aggregates. We don't have the air uh, spaces or pore space, I should say. Our microbes aren't, aren't as efficient. Another thing, and we do this fantastic here in Manitoba. We have fantastic crop rotations. Is there anyone here that has three crops in their rotation or more. All hands go up, right? In the States, their rotation can often be corn, snow, corn, snow, corn, right? Oh, maybe a little soybean, but then we're gonna go back to corn. Or soybean, snow, soybean. And if we're lucky, it's corn, soybean, corn, soybean, right? A lot of the resistance issues that we see here in Manitoba are because of the easy button that was hit down south. And we want to have these different root systems tap roots versus fibrous root systems. These plants will pull nutrients and water from different levels of your soil, of your field. If you have the same crop, a monoculture, every single year, you're drawing from the same area all the time. The whole message here is diversity, right? We have to, you know, mix things up. We also want to encourage very wide microbial population. The more microbes that we have in the soil, the better. 
we know canola doesn't play nicely with mycorrhizae. Then sometimes, you know, they'll say, oh, well, phosphorus isn't going to be very available the next year because, you know, by the time they all build themselves up again, there could be issues. We've heard that you should never put corn after canola. Canola should follow corn. Well, I'm starting to see a bit of a difference in some of the trends that we're seeing in our benchmarking program. So I'm not com completely convinced on that. What we are looking for though, broadleaf oil seed or like cereal oil seed, cereal oil, oil seed, cool versus warm season. We want to start changing it up. Think back to that very first slide that I showed that had farmers that were just breaking soil. Do you think there was just one species on that particular field that they were breaking? How many species can you maybe guess would be there? I have no clue, but by just looking at it, it sure looked to be an awful lot. We can see a tremendous impact on soil health. So building up those uh, microbial colonies, which make those aggregates and soil structure. If you have five different plant species. So if we can keep good rotation, we're going to be, I don't want to say ahead of the game, but we're also going to be switching up the chemistries that we're using. Hopefully we're not going to be seeing the same pathogens like the soil diseases, insects. Hopefully we're not going to see any of those carry on as we switch things around. I get it. It has to pencil out. Totally understand. We also need our soil to be working and functioning properly. This is really small. I know it is, but I just wanted to show that um, down in, at NDSU, they have what they call a crop rotation intensity and diversity worksheet. Really neat. What I did, just out of fun, I went in here and I said, okay, canola, corn, soybean, wheat. That was my rotation. It told me that I had a rotation intensity rating of 1.5. When you go into, like there's two tabs, I didn't copy that one over either. It told me that for my area by the Red River, we want to have at least a rating of 1.5 or higher. Perfect. That's great. And then when it comes down here to the, my diversity worksheet, it, uh, you want to have at least a rating of two. I'm at 2.5. It says a great goal would be three, which would probably mean I'd have to get another crop into that rotation. Maybe, you know, some, some cover crop or something in there to increase that score. But this at least gives you an idea. So if anybody wants this link, I know it's really hard to see. Contact me, contact me, I'll get it over to you. It's free, it's on their website. And you can just go in, and you just select, like there's drop down menus, you just select, they calculate everything for you. That will just give you, a, it'll quantify a little bit what your rotation is actually scoring when we think about soil health and improving, improving these, uh, these ratings. What do you see in this picture? Canola, what do we see on the ground? Canola, this is where, you know, I, I might, I'm here to ruffle feathers. I have tried to get cover crops to work in our area, but I find it really, really tough and I would love to be corrected and proven wrong. I find it really hard because we have a very short season. When you have like a cover crop that are, is before and after your actual cash crop, it's called a, a shoulder crop, shoulder season. It's very difficult because we have a rainy season in the spring, ending at both end of June, then July, August, our precipitation falls predominantly as thunderstorms. We cannot predict when we're gonna get the next shot of rain. So in order, if we are to wait until mid-August, once, not uh, canola, but say any of your cereals, if you wanna seed a cover crop and get it established mid-August, you're gonna hopefully have to do a whole lot of rain dances, but then that's gonna mess you up for the harvest the crops that haven't been harvested yet, right? To get this one going, the, the cover crop going. Some of the things I tell my producers is like, you know what? Don't worry about tilling this just yet. Because what do we have here is, yes, they're volunteers, but I can say they're sort of like a cover crop because we've got live plants, we've got living roots. So therefore we do have a home like around like the, the roots, the rhizosphere, I'm sure you heard about that this morning. The microbes can be fed by the plant and the microbes can feed, then feed the plant in exchange. Leave these guys go until, you know, the soil is cooler, your microbes are, you know, going dark. If you, th like this, I, I wouldn't worry about like seeding in in spring. If you have a cereal crop, is a different story. That's maybe a whole lot more residue that you're not comfortable with. Then maybe incorporate late fall as like a green manure or... Hopefully it's gonna like winter kill. What we need is to have living roots. Another problem with that summer follow picture that I, sh the second slide I showed, is that when we don't have a food source 
for the microbes, they can't eat, they can't, they can't mineralize, they can't do their job. Their food is from plants, right? It's right around that rhizosphere. It's the carbohydrates that they get from the plant and then they release nutrients to the plant. If we don't have living roots, your microbes have nothing to eat. How do you feel if you haven't eaten in a while? Hangry? Miserable? Yeah. So same goes for these guys. My suggestion is, and I have farmers that like, you know, it's later October and they're like sending pictures going, hey, this will make you happy, Jen. Yes, they are. They're, ter they're, they're cultivating it in as green manure, but hey, it, it's at least getting turned back and the microbes, it is cooled off enough that the microbes really aren't active and I'm okay with that. We have mentioned controlling weeds and other things like insect pests, diseases with chemical chemicals. At this point, I believe that, uh, I mean, we have a number of days, or not days, sorry, a number of years until the rate at which plants are gaining resistance is faster than we can produce new modes of action. Producing a new chemical that has a different mode of action that a plant isn't already resistant to is extremely expensive and is a very long process. So we cannot rely on spraying alone. So we need to preserve the chemistries that we have as long as we possibly can. So maybe using some of these other forms, such as leaving some residue where, you know, those, those weeds aren't going to germinate. Uh, we have a little bit more moisture, so the plant has more moisture to grow. We have more, more microbial colonies in the soil that are building those good aggregates that water can infiltrate, and we just have healthier plants because of it. We definitely have a market now in the last probably decade or more of biological products, you know, whether they target like root growth or we have, you know, their nitrogen fixing bacteria that, you know, get added to, to the plant. Or if we are just looking to intercrop, adding in a, a legume, so piola. Has anyone ever grown piola? Fantastic, but oh my gosh, it is terrible to scout because canola and peas, terrible, terrible to scout. Because that's, if you want a good leg workout, seed some, <laughs> seed some piola. What's happening, right? Your legumes, are fixing atmospheric nitrogen, putting it down into the soil because they've got their rhizome, and then they're sending those over to the, the canola, and they're like, okay, perfect, thank you. And then, then the, the peas can climb up the canola. It's a very nice symbiotic relationship. But then, of course, it's a very thick canopy, so you have to watch for your diseases. One thing I'll say is, is herbicides, we're not so worried about herbicides affecting our soil health. We're looking more at our fungicides, but herbicide carryover, if you're looking at putting in some sort of a cover crop, if it is a dry year, you will have to pay attention to what you're spraying, how much moisture you've had, has that chemical been activated, is there any residuals left, and is it safe, or is it going to kill whatever you're trying to plant, right? So there is some planning to that. And then fungicides, we can kind of look at them like insecticides. They probably kill some good with the bad. Insecticides, we have to spray for aphids, but we've got a lot of ladybugs. Well, we know we're going to take them down too, but you know, if we don't, then the aphids are going to outpace us, right? Unfortunately, that is some of the, some of the, uh, sort of the trade-off. Let's not forget that, uh, we've had, uh, improvements with, with combines as well, not just all the other pieces of equipment. These guys have, you know, great straw choppers. You can spread it really nice across like the width of your header. So, you know, you should, especially if you have row cleaners, you should be able to seed into this without a problem. We have then smaller pieces of residue that the microbes can start to work on. And also don't forget the little ground beetles, they'll be in there and they'll be like ripping it apart and shredding things. What I want you guys to leave here today with is that it's definitely a balancing act. We know we need the microbes to build the aggregates so we have the pore spaces so that the microbes can continue to keep the soil or that we have uh, area for water to infiltrate that can then feed our, our plants. But right now we're, we're cultivating too much. We're disturbing the soil too much. And we can't go cold turkey. And you definitely have to think about all of this, how it works on your own farm. I'd asked you already, and I would suggest that you guys go home and take a look. What are your soil organic matter levels on your field? Are they above five? Are they below five? We want to increase that percentage. You're not just gonna go out and like switch all of your equipment. But what do you have at home, right? Are you using strip till? Are you using high speed disc? Are you using a planter? Is it uh, vertical tillage? Is there a way that you can do rotational tillage? Till after cereals, till after your corn, 
but don't maybe just run harrows after soybeans or edible beans and your canola. Leave it alone. I don't know what your weed spectrum is on your fields. Maybe that's an issue. So maybe that is one of your reasons for cultivating. But as we do cultivate, yes, we are disturbing soil. So we're pulling those emerged plants out, but then we're also seeding other seeds that were on the surface. And like I said, I don't know what your, your weed spectrum is, but you definitely have to keep an eye on that because you can't just go cold turkey straight over to no-till and not have a plan to deal with, with weed. If you want to leave your volunteers, hopefully you don't have that many. You know, I want to see all of that seed going into, you know, into the combine and then off the field into your bin. However, if you do have some and you don't think that you can get a cover crop in or you don't, you're not set up for it, you don't have the time, okay, maybe that's an option. Leave a little something. Because if you have some plants that are growing, they're going to secure your soil. You'll have reduced wind and water erosion. You're going to have living roots for those microbes. There's a lot of benefit to it. And then, like I mentioned in a previous slide, you can incorporate it. And then it's like some green manure for, for the microbe. What I am going to say is that it, you start it really slow. Don't just jump in full farm. Try a little piece. If you have those salty areas that you don't seem to be able to grow anything but kosher, start there. See what you can do. There's programs out there that will help offset the cost of, say, putting a permanent forage in there and gaining those acres back. There are ways to do it. And I think we have to take a look at how to do this sooner than later. We've all heard that by 2030, we have to reduce our nitrogen fertilizer utilization by 30%. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but these are some of the ways that we might be able to gain some efficiency in the field just by encouraging and supporting the microbial colonies that are already there. These are the four pillars that I want to remind you of, is that modern, okay, so modern farming, we are really dependent right now on synthetic fertilizer. New genetics that have built-in tolerances, whether it be club roots, so it being cis nematode, you name it, there's all sorts of resistances that are built in. We are addicted to pesticides. We want that easy button. We want to spray it and forget it. That's gone. And we also have an addiction to tillage. I want you guys to remember these four pillars. Reduce your soil disturbance throughout the season as much as you can because that will leave your microbial factories intact and able to just keep exchanging nutrients with your crop. Utilize more plant species to increase diversity. We already have a really good wide rotation, so keep that up. Intercropping, like I said, piola, if you want to, add that in. Have living roots in your field as long as possible, because that is what feeds your microbes. And it, when they do eat, then they have the, they produce the glomalin, which is that protein that then glues everything together. And then keep them covered as much as you possibly can. For wind, to, to slow down wind and water erosion, protect it like the, the soil armor, and just to keep it a little bit cooler so you don't have that evaporative loss. That is the end of past, present, and future, incorporating, you know, all that we've learned about microbes into farming today.